Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and in today's video I'm going to teach you how to play Tesseract. This is a brand new game from Smirk and Dagger Games. It is a one to four player game that takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play, and is a fully cooperative game where all the players are working together to solve the mystery of the Tesseract and complete the puzzle before time runs out. So in the game itself, you are playing some of the smartest minds in the world. And these, this alien tesseract has appeared six days ago and you are running out of time. You can see that it is condensing on itself and slowly ticking away. So as the players, you are going to be pulling cubes from there, placing them in your lab and trying to get different combinations that you'll be able to use to lock dice in the containment area. Once all of those areas are full, the players have won. They must do this before the last die is pulled from the Tesseract or the seventh breach has happened. If either one of those happens before the eight players are able to contain all of the different dice, then the players have lost the game. So in this video, I'm going to teach you how to play starting with components, setup, player turns, and end game conditions. As always, if you find my videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button and subscribing to my channel. It's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so we can continue to grow, be able to produce this content. If you want to stay on all the videos I put out, also hit that notification bell and that'll let you know whenever I drop new videos. I'm also going to have a playthrough video for this one up shortly, so if you want to check that out, I'll have a link in the description below and I'll also have a link at the end of the video. So let's go ahead and head to the table and I'll teach you how to play. The first component I want to go over are the dice, and there are 64 different dice included in the game. These are broken down into 16 of each of the colors, blue, orange, purple, and yellow. Each die is going to have numbers 1 to 6 on it, which you can determine by counting the number of dots. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. There are also four mini decks of cards included in the game. This first deck are the containment cards, and these are going to be very powerful cards that players are going to have to unlock throughout the game by locking different dice in the containment area, which I'll go over a little bit more later. Each one of these is going to have a name, a little image of it, when it can be used, and the effect that it will have when you use it. There are also three levels of research cards, level two, three, and four. These cards are finite, so when a deck runs out, that is it. You will not reshuffle these cards and players will, will not be able to gain cards of that level anymore. Each of these cards is going to give the player a free action that they can use during their turn. Each card is going to list the name of that card, the level, and an image, and then the effect of that card when that player discards that card to use its ability. During player setup, each player will be randomly dealt a researcher card. Alternatively, if the group agrees, the players can select which researcher they'd like to play as. Each of these cards is going to list the name of the researcher on the top, along with its image and its two abilities. The top ability is a passive or always on ability that will be triggered whenever the player meets those conditions. The bottom ability is an action that the player must spend to trigger that unique ability. Some of the researchers also are going to have a little diamond in the bottom corner, which signifies that that researcher is very good at teamwork and helping other players. Tesseract also has four baseboards, and these are going to be double-sided. Each baseboard is going to have all kinds of different images on it, and when revealed, those images are going to have different effects that you'll find on the event key on your breach board. And with these, this is where you're going to be stacking all your different dice at the beginning of the game during setup, as you're going to see. Each of the baseboards also is going to have a number in the center on both sides, and these are going to represent the difficulty level of that board. The board that has the sides 1 and 2 on it is your introductory board. Sides 3 and 4 is going to be your standard board. 5 and 6 will be a challenging board. At that point, you're also going to flip over your breach board, and you'll have a new key with all kinds of different images on it. And then finally, 7 and 8 is going to be your difficult board. The breach mat also is going to keep track of the breaches you are going to have throughout the game. And I'll explain how those work a little bit later. And the final board I want to go over is the containment board. With this board, this is going to track how well you're doing throughout the game. And in order to win, you have to fill up all of the 24 slots with one of each of the numbers in each of the colors. On the perimeter of the board are going to be the six different spaces you're going to be placing containment cards face down during setup. Once you have locked at least two colors of that number, you're going to reveal that card so you can see what it is, and that'll help you determine when you hopefully want to unlock it. In order to unlock a card, you have to have all four colors of that number. So once I have all four sixes, I would unlock the number six and be able to use that. And then again, that's going to provide me with a one-time use. 
Once you fill up all of the color or all the numbers in one color, you're also going to be able to place a destroyed die back on the Tesseract. And I'll show you how that works a little bit later. Now we're ready to move into setup. So first you're going to put the main game board out in the middle of the table, and then you're going to build your Tesseract. So you have the two bases that are going to slide together, and then you'll place them on top of that board. Then you can go ahead and grab the Lazy Susan and place that on top of that. And then from there, go ahead and select which one of the boards you want to use. For this setup, I'm going to go ahead and use the beginning board or introductory board on number one. You're going to just place that on top of there. From there, then you can go ahead and pay, place your build your cube builder on top of that lined up. And then you're going to be dropping all of the different dice in there, making sure that each level fills up before adding dice to the next level. Once you have all the dice in there, it's good just to kind of give the sides a little squish just to make sure that the cube is all pressed together really nice. Then you can go ahead and remove that. Next, go ahead and place your containment board next to your main board. You can also grab your containment cards, shuffle that deck up, and then randomly place out one card above and below each one of these different spots. Any remaining cards you have can be returned to the box as you will not be using them for this game. Next, go ahead and grab the three different levels of research cards, separate them into each of their levels, and then go ahead and shuffle them up and place them next to the game board. Next, go ahead and place out your breach mat, and you want to have it on the side based on the base plate you selected. For base plates one through four, you're going to use this front side. For five through eight, you'll use the back side that has the larger number of icons on it. Then you're going to also take the breach token and place it on the zero space. For player setup, each player is going to receive a yellow dashboard and a token to keep track of the number of actions that player has. I'm going to go ahead and set up for a two-player game. Then go ahead and grab the researcher deck, shuffle it up, and deal one researcher card out to each player. Each player can reveal that researcher and then tell the other players what kind of actions and abilities that researcher has. Each player is going to be dealt a level two research card as well. Then each one of the researchers is going to take a corner die from the top of the Tesseract, roll it, and place it in their lab. So with my player, my computer programmer, I'm going to go ahead and take, I'm going to take this yellow two, give that a roll, and it happens to be a two. And then my other logistics manager will take the blue die, give that a roll, and it's a four. From there, then, based on the number of players, you're going to take two cubes from the Tesseract. In a two-player game, or one or two-player game, you're going to take the other two corner dice. In a three-player game, you'll take one corner die and one die right below that. And in a four-player game, you're going to take two dice, starting with the lowest value die on the Tesseract. So you'll go around and look. And so we have a two, a one, a two, and a three. So we would take the one and then the die directly below that. You're going to go ahead and roll those dice and then place them in the primed areas based on the numbers that are rolled. From there, you're ready to begin the game. Tesseract is played over an undefined number of turns. Starting with the first player and proceeding clockwise, players are going to continue taking turns until one of the end game conditions is met. Either the players are going to win the game by completing the containment board, or the players are going to lose the game if, before they're able to complete the containment board, one of these two other conditions happens. The first is if the last die is pulled off of the Tesseract, and the other one is if the seventh breach is triggered. If either one of those are triggered before the containment board is full, then the players have lost the game. Moving into the game, the final step is to select a starting player. And you can do this in any manner you want to, whether it is the player that is most familiar with the game, or a player that last checked the time, or some other method, however you want to do it. For my game, I'm going to have the logistics manager be the starting player. From there, we're ready to move into a player's turn. During a player's turn, it is broken down into two phases. The first phase is the action phase, and during this phase, that player is going to perform three actions from a selection of six possible actions, which are to remove, adjust, contain, transfer, and to study, or the unique action that your particular researcher has. You can perform the same action multiple times if you want to, or perform different actions. It is completely up to you. You're also allowed to, to perform any number of free actions, which are by using any of the research cards you have. There is no limit to the hand size of research cards you have either. So from there, let's go ahead and move into the game, and I will take you through each one of these actions in more detail to show you how they all work. 
The first type of action a player can perform is a remove action. This allows the player to select one of the dice on the Tesseract and remove it and add it to their lab. Now there are a couple of important rules with this. In order to be able to select a die on the Tesseract, it must have three or more open faces on it. And each side is considered an open face. For example, with this yellow die, the six on top is open, the five and the four. So this die would have three open faces. But if we look at the dice in the center, they only have one open side, so those are not able to be removed. Likewise, going down the side here, this purple die has three open sides, but the blue die directly below it only has two open sides, so I could not select that one, but I could select that purple one. When selecting a die as a player, you can also rotate the Tesseract so you can see all the different options and check to see if a die is open. For example, let's go ahead and say that I select this blue die. So I'm going to go ahead and take it from the Tesseract, and without changing its value, I'll place it in one of the slots in my lab. The adjust action allows you to increase or decrease a die by one value in your lab or in the primed area. For example, with this 4, I could increase it to a 5 or decrease it to a 3. One important note with this is if a die is at 6, you cannot increase it to a 1, and likewise if it is at 1, you cannot decrease it to a 6. Adjusting a die in the primed area can help you prevent a breach or set the die up to be destroyed during a containment, as I'll cover a little bit later. Now there is one exception to the rule that I stated before. In the primed area, you can adjust a 1 below 1, basically destroying it and removing it from the primed area. The contain action is the most important action in the game and allows you to take a die from your lab and place it in the containment area in an open space, bringing you one step closer to winning. In order to be able to take this action, you must have a valid set or run of dice in your lab. So first, let's take a look at what that is. A set is where all of the dice are the same number. A run is where you have a consecutive sequence of numbers, for example, 4, 3, 2. The other part of this is that a set or run must be valid. In order for a set or run to be valid, you must have three or more dice in that set or run, and they must all be the same color, or all of them must be different colors. For example, this run is considered a valid run as it has three dice that are all the same color in the consecutive sequence. Likewise, this set would also be valid as it has all, all the dice are fours and they are all different colors. Once you determine that you have a valid set or run, the next thing to do is to select one of the dice in that set or run and place it in an open space on matching that die's color and number. So let's look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say, for example, that I decide to use this set of fours. With that, I'm going to select one of those dice, now that that is a valid set, to place in the containment area. On top of that, if the die matches the same color and number as a die in the primed area, I get to destroy that primed die, and only one of those primed die, even if there are multiples of the same color and number. So in this set, I do have a orange four. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose that one. I'm gonna go ahead and place that in the containment area, locking it in play. This one will be destroyed then. Even if there were two orange fours, I could only choose one of those to destroy and place off to the side. Now there is one optional rule with this as well. You can choose with the remaining dice that you have in your lab for that set or sequence that you just used to re-roll those dice and place them back in your lab. If you choose this, you'll also gain a research card of a level equal to the number of dice you re-roll. For example, I had these two fours remaining from that set that I used. I could choose to either place them back in my lab and keep them for later use, or I could choose to gain a level two research card as there are two dice left, and then I would re-roll these dice, placing them back in my lab. This could potentially give me another thing that I could use at a later point. Plus, I get a research card. This is one of the only ways you can gain new research cards. The study action allows you to discard a research card in your hand to draw a research card of the next level. For example, I could discard this realignment and draw a level 3 research card. Now, one important note with this is that each one of the decks is finite, which means that when all the cards are out of that deck, you will not reshuffle it to create a new deck. You simply will not be able to draw cards from that deck anymore. So you want to be careful how often you do this particular action. But don't be afraid of it either, as the cards in the higher level decks are very powerful and are very good to have.
The transfer action allows you to take a die from your lab and give it to another player to place in their lab, or to take a die from another player's lab and place it in your lab. Now with this, both players do have to agree to the transfer. And the final type of action I can take is the unique action that is listed on my researcher's card. For example, with a logistics manager, I have Inspire, which allows me to transfer two cubes between any player's labs. During your turn, you're also allowed to use your research cards as free actions. You can use them at any point during your turn. Now that I've covered the six different types of actions you can take, let me put this all together and take you through an action phase. So moving into my logistics manager's action phase, I do have that four blue. So I have a couple of different options here. First off, let's go ahead and do another remove action to gain another die. So I'm gonna go ahead and select I'm gonna go ahead and select this purple four here. And then I'll place that in there. So that was my first action. And I can use my marker there to keep track of how many actions I have remaining. Next, I am going to, I might as well take another one. So I'll remove another die and I'll take this one. Then I have one action remaining. So with that last action, I'm gonna go ahead and do a contain action. This is going to, again, allow me to choose one of these cubes in this valid set to place in the containment area. So I'm gonna go ahead and go and choose that orange four. I will get to destroy the orange four in the primed area. And then I think I do want to gain a research card. So I'm gonna gain a level two research card and re-roll these two dice. So I have a two and a three, great. So that kind of sets me up for my next turn. So from there, that is the end of my turn. I do not want to use any of my uh, cards at this time. So then it is going to move into the second part of my turn, which is the threat phase. And the last thing I wanna go over real quick is the containment board, as there are certain bonuses that are going to be unlocked throughout the game. The first one are the containment cards. And as I talked about earlier, once you have placed or locked the second cube of that number, in, a containment, in the containment area, you're going to get to reveal that card, helping you decide whether or not that's one you want to get earlier or later in the game. The other thing is once you've placed all four, so let's go ahead and add that in there real quick. We have one there and a four here. So once the fourth number has been placed of that number, where all four colors of that number have been locked, you get to unlock that card, placing it out on the table where any player can use it during their turn. Once it is used, then it'll be discarded as normal, as each one of these is a single-use only card again. The other thing is once you have all of the numbers of a particular color. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that all six of the orange spaces had been filled in. At that point, I can choose any die that has been destroyed and add it back to the Tesseract. The second phase in a player's turn is the threat phase. And during this phase, the Tesseract is reconfiguring itself, slowly ticking down to detonation. What this means is that you're going to be taking one or more cubes off of the Tesseract, rolling them, and placing them in the primed areas under the numbers you rolled. This can trigger breaches, which you'll have to move your breach counter up for each breach that is triggered. And you can also end up revealing icons on the base plate. If you do, you're going to consult your event key and resolve that immediately, potentially taking more dice off of the Tesseract and having to place them in the primed area, among all kinds of other effects. So from here, let's go ahead and dig into this and take a closer look at how this phase works. The first step in the threat phase is prime. During this step, you're going to slowly rotate the Tesseract and try to figure out which of the cubes are removable and are the lowest in height on the Tesseract and value. So as we rotate, we can see that there's a two on yellow and a three on yellow, a two on orange and a one in purple. So those four are tied right now for the lowest heights that are removable. So then we're gonna go by the lowest value, which right now the purple one is the lowest value. But let's go ahead and say instead that this was removed. And then as we turn the Tesseract, we have the one die that is the lowest height. So that one will automatically be selected. Then again, if there was a tie, so if there was two dice that had a five, the player gets to choose which one of those would be removed. After you've selected a die, go ahead and roll that die and place it underneath the value in the primed area. If this is the third or higher die placed under that value, you're going to trigger a breach, advancing the breach marker by one point. 
If this is the sixth or higher die placed underneath that value, you're going to trigger a breach and advance the breach marker by two points. So now let's look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say that we already had two fives out there. And then we rolled another die, triggering or placing another five in there. At this point, this is the third die that is placed underneath that number. So that is going to trigger a breach. So we're going to place or advance the breach marker by one point. Then let's go ahead and say during the next player's turn, that player rolls a five as well. This is also going to trigger a breach, advancing that breach marker by one more point. Now, one other important note with this is during the player's turns, if the player advances a die, so if I chose to, let's go ahead and say that these were out here like this, and I chose to advance this die to a five and move it there, that would not trigger a breach. Only during the threat phase when a die is added, that would trigger a breach. But again, if a, during the threat phase, another die came up as five, that would trigger a breach as that is the fourth die placed. The one other example I want to look at is removing a cube that will reveal an icon on the base plate. So in this example, let's go ahead and say that during the threat phase, I have to remove this cube. When I do, I'm going to roll and resolve it as normal, placing it in the primed area, and then immediately trigger the effects of that revealed icon. So with that particular one, that is a chain reaction. I'm going to prime the lowest cube on the Tesseract. So with this one, I have to do another cube. So I'll select another cube in the same manner and roll that one. If that cube is the bottom cube, again, revealing another icon, I will continue that process, resolving that icon as it is revealed. Once you've completed your threat phase, then your turn is over and it'll pass to the next player in Clyco's order to take their turn. This is going to continue going player after player until one of the endgame conditions is met. Either the players are going to win together by completing their containment board before the seventh breach or the last die is taken off, or if the seventh breach or the last die is taken off the Tesseract before that happens, then all the players are going to lose. So I hope you found the video helpful in learning how to play Tesseract. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please post those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And thanks so much for taking the time to watch the video and leave me feedback on it. I do really appreciate it and take into account everything you say to make the best possible videos. Until next time, I'll see you later.